Welcome to the Zero to Five Million Dollar Podcast. I'm Sean Fine, and I'm with my host Ollie Whitfield. This show is brought to you by Autoclose, a vanilla soft company. Ollie, what are we talking about today? There's a role on your team, and I would go as far as to say, in um, in many sales teams, this is very underappreciated. But it is, in fact, the most important person or role or type of role on the team. So any guesses at all what that might be? And no, it's not you, just saying. On a sales team? Yeah. The sales manager. Sales manager. We've, we nearly got there. I was about to say it's the sales admin, the sales ops person. But I guess they work pretty close with that person. And sometimes that person actually does some of that work. Why did you say sales manager out of interest? I would say the sales manager because they're the ones that have to help the team with uh, conversions, with coaching, with opportunities with negotiating opportunities with finding out who is the right prospect are they going after the right prospect um they got to help with customer relationships there's a ton of things i think this i think the sales engineer sales op person only comes in once once that prospect's on a demo and might need some technical stuff on the demo but the person that's going to actually get the sales team going is definitely the sales manager <clears throat> okay, so maybe we've abandoned this topic and we're going to have a debate here. Or um, I think you you made a bit of a clash there with something that I think is the role of the sales ops person. I think a sales engineer is the, I'll do the demo for you. Let me do the technical stuff. That yeah. that I totally agree. I I thought, maybe I'm wrong, maybe we're both wrong. The ops, The sales ops person was more of a checking the reports. They set the cadence up. And they they basically set everything out for you to go and do. So have I got that wrong or is that you? No, but you're right. They're the ones that said all that. But who's the one that actually goes and then has one-on-ones with those sales people to talk about the data that they're providing? So the sales op person is just giving you some data, analyzing data, building the sequence and stuff. But at the end of the day, the sales people are the, still the ones doing it. And the sales manager is the one whose job's on the line if the sales team's not performing. Not the sales ops person. And what if the sales ops person makes a horrible cadence, then everyone fails? Then then the sales manager is the one that has to get rid of the sales ops person and find someone that's capable of doing it. They both lost in the end then, didn't they? So it's the sales ops person who lost first. Well, it's, 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 no? it's, it's like upper management, sales manager, sales op, and then the op kind of you know is that, that right-hand person to the manager. But at the same time, that manager has got to be the one that's facilitating that stuff down all the way to the reps. So the sales, the, he, can, he can provide you the data and build all those stuff and give you the cadences that you need and the sequences, the scripts and all that other stuff. But at the end of the day, you need the salespeople to be performing. And who's the one that's doing the coaching, the training, the motivating, the you know how to choose which prospect you should be deciding and spending more time on? That's the sales manager. Okay, so I'm not going to try and move you on that because – you you think you're a sales manager, so you're going to argue that to death. But um, talk to me about what would be now. Ideal is is not perfect because it's it's different for every company here. But um, budget permitting and just usual logic applying to help me understand what does a usual sales team look like. Now, obviously, I know what ours looks like, but what would the ideal case be? Let's say would there be a one to two ratio of SDR and AE, which is obviously sales development people and then account executive to closers. Would there then be with that group one sales ops person and one sales manager and a vice president? Is that normal? Is that too much? Is that too little? Have I got my so, ratios so, wrong? Depends on where you are. And you know, you know, are you a company doing 10 million, 25 million, 50 million? But I would say the most important thing is you need that that you know, one solutions engineer for probably at least three of your account executives. And the reason why is Nowadays, there's so many people, so many companies when they're when they're looking at platforms, they're looking for integrations. What do you integrate with? How does it integrate? How's the integration look? What pushes? What pulls? So you need that solutions engineer right there. Now you need the operations person that is basically building out that playbook for those account executives. Now the account executives, you need to have at least a two to three to one ratio with each SDR BDR to an account executive because. If you're not filling the account executive's calendar with one or even two, they're sitting there twiddling their thumb, thumbs if they're not uh, not doing inbound or outbound. So I would say three-one ratio SDR BDR to AE, 
another three to one ratio, three A's to one solutions um, engineer, and then one operations that I think can probably handle, you know, they're definitely a, a lot more scalable where you can probably at least handle a five to 10, maybe even more um, account executives under you. So you need more SDLs than you need account execs, and then you need more account execs than you need uh, sales engineers, to use yep. the word SE there. And then how many managers are we talking about in there and what levels? And I would then, I would then say you need, you need less solutions engine, engine, solution op- operators than you do an engineers or AEs. So it's kind of like almost like a pyramid. Yeah. I How much would you say that costs as well? That this is where it gets quite interesting. That's a fairly established team with plenty of people and plenty going on, but it's good. that's a lot of people with comp. That's going to be a lot, isn't it? It is, but I mean, you know, most teams that have solutions engineers or sales operations are enterprise companies. If you're a small company with doing, you know, a few million dollars, five million dollars, etc., you're not going to have a solutions engineer in all those other positions, right? The key here is. You need to have the sales operations building that engine of that SDR. That SDR needs to be like an army. It has to be an army that is just producing demos, producing leads for those AEs, right? Because if the it, it all starts at the bottom. If those SDRs, BDRs can't keep the AEs busy, the AEs don't keep the SEs busy. The SEs don't keep the operations busy because there's not enough people at the bottom of the level. Yeah. So then let's say that, let's play that out. That starts to happen a little bit. What, what's your first go-to with the A's? Because they're the first, they're not the first part of the problem. It's just performance for the SDR folks. But then the A are the first group who can do something about it. So are you saying to them, okay, you start prospecting a lot more too? Or are you saying go to really big accounts and, and cherry pick a couple in your spare time? Or what, what are we doing with them? Well, I think with the, with the AEs, you know, a, no AE wants to cherry pick and pick a small account because they know, if they're going to sell something for $1,000 a month, they're going to make $100 commission. That's not exciting to them. But if they sell something for $100,000, they're going to make $10,000 commission. That's exciting to them. So as an AE, you do want to pair You want to cherry pick and, and pick those, those larger deals. Definitely. Now, the SDRs you know, have their own numbers. To hit. So everyone has kind of their own numbers to hit, but it all starts at the bottom. Like, it's, you know, you, know, you see the, the, the pipeline starts here. No, with, with this, it starts, it, it's the bottom up. Right. You need to get you need to get the people that army said the infrastructure at the bottom. It's like building a condo. Right. You're building a condo. You have to have the infrastructure. You have to dig. Once you dig, you start putting up, you know, the barriers, the walls, the wood, the windows, the doors, the roof. you got to continue to build upwards with that team. Now, you do need them all to perform. Right. It's one it's one team. And if if, if you have a one bottleneck in that team, it's going to affect the other people. Right. So if you have a if you have a, a sales operations who's building terrible, doing terrible uh, scripts and funnels and this, that. The SDRs don't perform, which makes the AEs not busy, which makes the AEs not hit their numbers, which keeps the solutions engineers not busy. So it's all connected. Okay. So uh, we've gone way away from my idea here, but that's good. This was interesting. So (laughs) what what would they, um, aside from just the performance, like you said, if the SDR team is really struggling and then that has a, a bleeding down effect, how else can the sales team structurally go wrong? So I, I would imagine it's not common for them to have far too many uh, account executives versus, a, uh, versus SDRs. I would imagine that's um, fairly rare. But what else is there? What do people do commonly? I mean, I think there's a lot of companies that actually just totally skip the sales operations and they force the AEs to build it, right? Because what you want at that point is you want the the SDRs to be almost using the AE's voice when the actual person goes on a demo or a call or email connect or email back and forth to communicate. It sounds like they're talking to the same person. I know one thing a lot of people do hate is when there's too many cooks in the kitchen and you speak to one person. It's like, well, no, that person was an introvert. Now I'm speaking to an extrovert. Like I feel like I'm just talking to four or five different people. Then you got to make sure that everyone's related the same information. So I think the, the, the other thing that people don't really consider is, you have to have the same voice inside the company. You all have to be talking the same language, the same pain points, the same vision, the same mission. Everything needs to be the same. That's quite difficult to do on scale, but um, I see what you mean. I, I think I found it quite painful when um, things are overly rigid and um, overly prepared. There's an argument for the structure and that stuff, but 
So you, you talk to someone and then you get passed on to someone else and then someone else for the next bit. But the same question was asked in each of the calls and that type of thing. And it doesn't quite get answered and it gets answered in two or two in a bit different ways. That's the bit I find quite irritating when you've gone, when I've gone through that type of process. I, I, I think people like, I mean, I think the one thing companies don't do enough is, is really spend time on exactly what your company vision is like if somebody asks the same a, a question to be honest the, the company should answer the same the question the same way like it should be almost trained and embedded in their head that that's the way to answer the question they might have different personalities of the way if they say it but what your company's goal is what you try to accomplish what you try and solve how you try and help how you've done in the past it should all be similar now obviously that brings in another department called marketing but um no one likes them <laughs> But that's a that's a totally different discussion. But you have to have the same voice. Uh, I think that's very important. I mean, that's cool. But then you get into points when, as an account executive, you need to be cruel to be kind a little bit if a prospect's being a pain in the butt. And then that's then you're being different. But I know what you mean. We're, we're debating semantics a little bit with that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. I mean, our, so the, the sales team we have obviously is is designed a certain way, and what what it it almost is is the our solutions engineer is al- almost my right hand man, but also the AEs help, meaning like side by side with those AEs, and those AEs are not as successful without our solutions engineer. But also, he's the one that's reporting all the data back to me that I can make decisions on what to do with my team as well. So it's a very important role. It's almost like a middle manager at a bank or or, or at a company. Like they're middle manager and they, and they they report up, but they really manage both up and down. So without naming any names, obviously, but generally speaking, how does that um, that that role work? Because uh, a lot of times, I think it's only fairly recent, as far as I'm aware, that that role has been compensated properly. It's just kind of a paid to do job, no matter what of performance. But now you can see with obviously things like Salesforce and so on, that SE performed this well and the next one didn't so much and the other one was way better than both of them. And then you make comp. But there's an argument about how much are you truly involved. You're facilitating the demo, which is like one of the last things that happen. And there's got to be so many other things that line up beyond just the product itself. So how how does that work? Because that's complicated, isn't it? It's very interesting. So I I think the way certain companies use a SC is very different, meaning it all depends on the experience of your salesperson, right? And what they need. Someone that's just got into sales, had a few years in sales is going to depend a lot more on a solutions engineer just because they might not know the technical aspect of the engineering or anything else on the integration side. However, if you're someone at Salesforce, an SC might be little to less used. It might almost be after like, well, implementation they're used, right? The compensation is a tricky one, though, because, you know, depending on how involved are, they they might not be compensated. But if they are compensated, you know, sometimes sometimes they do just as much work as a AE. So it's a, it's a it's almost a it, it's one of those things that's never really been defined in a lot of companies, and it's tough because obviously you keep paying commission to everyone that touches an account. You know, there's only so so, so much margin in a, in the business. Uh, so it's just it, it's a it's always been a tough one. Is that uh, how do you deal with those those SEs? And it's it's still a tough one to commission them out. I feel like I, I almost feel like sometimes in our organization, our SEs are really doing a lot of the sales. They're doing a lot of the selling, but it's tough to compensate somebody because you know how do you how do you split that one pie between so many people? Yeah. So how would it work? Is it common to say no matter what, how much you touch a deal or how much you are involved or not? If you if you cross that line where you are involved, it's a flat. This happens. This is the commission. This if this is the outcome, or do you do you say no? I imagine this would be cause big arguments. You were so involved in this one that you get like a percentage more versus previous, or, or so does that happen? It doesn't work currently, but how I would do it is if you're an AE and you have a, an SC spend his time on a demo, your commission split. A certain Equally. percentage. Not it could be it could okay. be sixty forty, it could be seventy thirty. But there's no way an AE should get full commission for when they're only doing, you know, forty, sixty percent of the selling. Right? And it that it's still an argument that goes on not only in a lot of organizations. I speak to a lot of people and they're like, 
they still don't know how to compensate that SE because they are part of the process. Nowadays, people buy for a few reasons. One, ease of use and integrations. And two, relationship. So the AE can build that relationship, but if they can't explain the technical aspect of the integrations, that's where you need the SE in. And it takes both to close that deal. Yeah, because there's been several times, I mean, I can think of a few for us, where the SE has done an exorbitant amount of work to really make something work for a customer where it's kind of like a bend something into shape type of thing to make it work where no one else could do that. Yeah. And in, in those situations, they really, really do deserve a disproportionate amount of commission, don't they? Yep. But if you just put them as like, a, it's going to be this every time, well, A, why would I do that? I guess, because it's my job. And then B, the, the account executive is, is like, thank you so much for all of that money. That You're amazing. And I, I'm like, gee, that's great for me, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this this is this is a topic that I think, you know, it, it might actually be good for, some, for us to bring on a solutions engineer, someone that's managed a solutions engineer, because I think this is a, a hot topic right now. And I think a lot of the companies, you know, five, ten years ago, they never did this. They never had all these different layers. This is kind of a new way of selling. So uh, definitely a hot topic and a great, uh, great episode uh, for today. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, This has been another great episode. And as I said, a very hot topic in the sales community. Thank you also to everybody listening. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to give us a five-star review wherever you're listening from in the world. And also subscribe so you don't miss our next show. Uh, Thanks again, Ollie, and see you guys soon.